In the depths of our consciousness, dinosaurs lurk within with an unsettling primal fear. It is a fear that comes from a profound realization that, at any given moment, Mother Nature can make unimaginable monstrosities and that we, as humans, are powerless to do anything against them. Dinosaurs tap into our deepest vulnerabilities, even more so than modern predators like tigers, bears. As frightening as they may be, those are known to us. But the ancient creatures hold the unknown. Once upon a time, animals that we can only speculate as to their sheer power and will to survive in a hostile world. They represent a force of nature that is both captivating and horrifying, reminding us that even in the safety of our modern society, there are echoes of a time when survival was an everyday battle. But how about if that time wasn't an echo? What if it was in the here and now? What if you came face to face with a raptor or dwarfed by a dominating T-Rex, and that the only thing that they wanted to do was to kill you? That's pretty unsettling, and that is Dino Crisis. In the late 90s, Capcom was on top of the world. If you booted up a game on your PlayStation or Dreamcast, or even in the arcades and Capcom's logo flashed up, you knew you were in for a good time. They could do almost no wrong. Still riding the waves of Street Fighter and now making the most out of their recent smash hit Resident Evil, Capcom wanted to take this huge burgeoning franchise and genre another step further. Resident Evil 2 released to universal acclaim, and its sequel was due for release later in 1999. But in between, series creator, the legendary Shinji Mikami, who was currently in a producer role, wanted to stretch his directive skills once again, and hopefully give Capcom another hit franchise to add to their roster. Taking the survival horror genre and smashing it together with something even more terrifying than shambling zombies, dinosaurs, Dino Crisis was born. A sci-fi panic horror that still leaves ripples amongst gamers today. Released in 1999 on the Sony PlayStation, Dino Crisis was a hit. The stars were aligning for Capcom to allow Dino Crisis to be amongst their greatest franchises. But it never quite happened. The series died after only three main entries, all releasing within three or four years. And since 2003, we haven't seen a new game. And yet, despite its very brief life, many people still very fondly remember Dino Crisis. And today, we're gonna look at why. And today, I have to thank my dad. Yeah, usually I thank my Patreon producers for, you know, voting for a game. But no, this time, despite not talking to my dad for about four years, he somehow found my YouTube channel and asked me to cover Dino Crisis. And uh, considering that's the first thing he's ever told me to do in his life, I thought I would honor this once in a lifetime event. So yeah, dad, this is for you. I should probably tone down the drunken dad jokes from now on. They're only partially based on fact. And just for the record, me and my dad, we are cool. It's just that neither of us are needy enough to, you know, message each other for years on end. That's just how solid we are. But I do have to thank my patrons for their wonderful support. It's the best way to support my efforts with this channel. And also, I offer a lot of nice perks to find out exactly what and why I'll tell you later on. Or you could just click the link in the description and find out for yourself. And yeah, even though my dad asked me to do only the first game, I'm going to do the second game as well. They go together like chalk and cheese, even though they are both fun games in their own right. However, I am not touching Dino Crisis 3 because, well, it's Dino Crisis 3. Even Capcom, the kings of re-releases and compilations, want to pretend it doesn't exist. I've played Dino Crisis 3, I had it as a kid, and I hated it. And seriously, after playing the intro to that game for like 5 minutes just to sample it, a massive wave of nostalgic disappointment came over me. So yeah, this is a celebration of Dino Crisis, not an execution. I'll save Dino Crisis 3 for another video entirely by itself where I can actually execute it. In this video, I will take you through both of the games. I'll be explaining the story beat by beat, talking about the mechanics of the game, why they work, why they don't work, and of course, I'll be adding in a few jokes in there too. To be honest, that is the only reason I make these videos. Games are cool and all, but uh, being dumb is just better. Spoilers throughout, of course. If you've never played Dino Crisis 1 or 2 before, well, now you don't actually have to because you'll get the same experience here, just shorter and less key cards to pick up. 
Dino Crisis is a concept so pure as a video game concept, it's hard to believe it took until 1999 for it to actually happen. It's a game I played as a kid, or I would have if it didn't scare my 9 year old balls off. They still haven't recovered and I'm pretty sure that's why I'm short to this day. Because Dino Crisis 1 is more than a survival horror, it's a panic horror. And panic, I did. And I have my old dad to thank for that. Apparently the original Resident Evil didn't scar me enough because Dino Crisis was a day one buy for him and me and him tried to complete it. As I've said, it was originally a PlayStation 1 game, but for the purpose of this retrospective, I'm playing the Dreamcast release, which came out a little bit later. And that's just because it looks better. Now, I am a big fan of PS1 texture warpage, but I do know I'm in the minority, so I thought I'd spare you guys. The Dreamcast version is super slick, as you can see. Booting up the game, you have the classic warning. This game contains scenes of explicit violence and gore. Yeah, baby, when you see that, you know you're in for a good time. It's like, things are gonna go down here, Jimmy. You're either in or you take this back to the store immediately. You've either got the guts for it or you ain't. Although even if you had, they're probably splashed all over the floor when a dinosaur gets too full and doesn't fancy eating your guts, they just settle for the stomach. From the main menu, you have the choice of playing on normal or easy. For this playthrough, I went with normal because I'm a normal person. I ain't easy unless I'm drunk. The game starts out so pre-2000s. It's someone going through their emails, obviously super secret government agency style. I mean, look at all them grids. You get a voicemail from an undercover agent called Tom. He's infiltrated a research lab on an island pretending to be a scientist dude. He's even got that soulless sociopathic look on his face. He definitely wants to get you hooked on meds. He says there haven't been any signs of new weapon technology being developed here, but as a bit of serendipity, he got eyes on a scientist named Dr. Kirk. At least it's not Captain Kirk, otherwise those lady scientists ain't safe. Now he's supposed to be dead. Dead from an experiment gone wrong three years ago. He was known for trying to create the ultimate energy source, but was refused funding. Then he mysteriously blows up and is presumed dead. But no, it turns out he's working on this island in the made-up republic of a uh, made-up here. It, it has a name, I just can't remember it. Your task as a government agent is to extract him. Can't have that dude making unlimited clean energy. How could we get all that lobbying money from the oil barons? Four of you are parachuted out of a chopper on a choppy day, but only three of you land at the rendezvous point. And here we get a decent look at the personality of the main characters. Gale, the leader, is focused only on the mission. Cooper the missing agent is expendable, just like the rest of the team, even himself. Regina and Rick are the more normal people, and Cooper, well, Cooper's one of those dead people. I actually think it's a bit of a shame the T-Rex is shown so early. I would have dumped my arse more thoroughly if I hadn't seen it prior to the first encounter with Regina. Although I suppose the marketing would never have allowed the T-Rex to be a secret. They'd have kicked down the director's door with a warrant trying to confiscate the footage. They need it for marketing. Entering the facility, something's not quite right here. Aside from the giant T-Rex we just saw, there are no lights on in the guardhouse. I wonder what happened to them. The suspense is killing me. Gale goes off to investigate while you wait behind. He gives you the all clear with a beep of the radio which flashes bright green. Perfect for a covert operation, I'm sure you'll agree. Imagine sitting in a dark, shadowy corner trying not to be detected when some prick decides to morse code you and it turns the place into a Las Vegas light show. You might get rumbled. Anyways, Rick runs off to secure the control room, as though he knows there's no one there anymore. Gale is pulling off his best Barry Burton impression by being very pensive over some blood. I'm sure he's hoping it's not Chris's blood. The fencing is also wrecked. Someone sure had a party here. Finally, you get control of Regina properly, and here you'll find the game's got your classic tank controls, which works perfectly under the circumstances. If you played Resident Evil, you'll know exactly how this is supposed to be controlled, and even played. They are remarkably similar games, which you might expect, I suppose, but still you'll feel right at home. The first item you pick up is a key to a backup generator. You can't get more Resident Evil than that. If there's not a key to a backup generator, are you really playing a survival horror game? Doubtful. With the key firmly in hand, Rick checks in to say the power in the entire facility has been cut and he can't do jack from the control room. Maybe you can try to access a backup generator. How lucky you just picked up a key. You and Gale head over to the backup generator, it, like he knows where it is, and thankfully the game is nice enough to tell you you're in the right direction with every place in the game being labelled as you enter the door. That's so convenient, how thoughtful. That's disgusting. 
I love her, like really. She's obviously sociopathic or has a good case of the trench humor, but she's hot and has a personality. Regina is the kind of girl I think I'd like, but then after we get married and she leaves me at home alone with the kids every single night while she goes off with the biker gang, then I've just seen my future that never came to pass. This ain't looking good, but what is good is stealing from a corpse. Nice med pack. Gail waits outside while you go in turn on the generator. It's here that you'll come across the first of many puzzles in this game, which will either be good or bad news for those who like them or not. They're all logic puzzles, and most of them are easy enough. They also tend to reuse puzzles a lot, making more difficult versions of them. This one's super easy, obviously. You see four fuses in the machine, and you need to match the order of the handles. The game's hoping you'll notice that, but we're all clever buggers, aren't we? Unless you're colorblind. Then sorry, you are in the wrong decade for developers to care. They don't even know you exist. As the generator whirs into life, outside we hear this. Gail? Yeah, I think I better double check that I know how to aim and do a 180 turn. I love how she aims with a pistol with just one hand. Amateur or badass? I'm gonna go with the latter. That's just gangster. Going out, you see blood and a broken fence off a cliff. Gale is gone, boy. This is a horror game. Never wait outside. In 1999, this would have been pretty terrifying, especially because he doesn't give up. Dinos can be persistent. They can even follow you through doors. They may have teleported 65 million years in the future, but even the newfangled technology of door handles ain't stopping them, especially when they can just jump over fences or through windows. But still, they can pop through doors. So it's only a matter of time before they invent fire, and then the next step, the flamethrower. At which point, we are all truly buggered. With Gale gone, presumed dead, Rick tells you to come over to the control room. When you get a new target destination, like someone tells you to go to this certain place, your map will pop up to show you. What I like about this is that it's not universal. If no one tells you where to go, you just have to figure it out for yourself. The map won't help you. But if they explicitly tell you, it'll show up on your map. For me, this is a great compromise between helping the player and still being immersive. There's nothing more I hate these days in games than constantly telling the player where to go at all times without any subtlety or explanation. Immersion is meaningless compared to getting impatient morons to buy their game. There's no adventure or thought on the player's part and it's an easy way for developers to get out of giving good world building. Dino Crisis has a great balance because it makes sense. I know, I have a gatekeeping boomer approach and I apologize for that, but I'm, I just enjoy using what's left of my brain and the brain cells within it. Sorry. Obviously, as an option to turn on in the menus, I'm all for that. I'm not as mean as I jokingly appear, but uh, I appreciate if developers stretch their immersion legs just by default, you know, come on. Off to the control room you go. You end up in an ominous looking corridor with windows. Where have I seen this setup before? You hear something growling away and you're just waiting for it to jump through the window. Also, I like how one of the notes on the wall says, Dr. Kirk is giving a lecture about stabilizers. Like, I know this is like a secret facility, but couldn't you have tried to hide the fact he's supposed to be dead? You know, shave his head, call him Dr. Pilkington, let him talk about chimps in space or something. I don't know, maybe be a bit more subtle or secretive. And the agent who bumped into him did he not read any of the signs? His name is plastered in more places than Interpol's most wanted list. How did it take him two weeks to realize he was here? Your path is blocked, but one of the traversal mechanics in this game is going up into the ventilation shafts. This is used rather sparringly, which makes it slightly more annoying because I often didn't even notice the vent plate laying on the ground, which is the indicator of there being somewhere to climb. It's not something you take mental note of when you're being chased by velociraptors. Thankfully, you do get a notice on your map, which I only realized when looking back on my footage to write this script. Never mind. This ventilation shaft conveniently leads to the control room where Rick is pretending not to play StarCraft. After Rick hears your story and Regina saying she wants to complete the mission, that dude says what we've all been thinking at this point. 
Let's just get the frig out of here. There's no firing squad for desertion in 1999. At worst, it's a slap wrist and your family may disown you from shame. But that's better than being eaten by a dinosaur. I don't know about you. And in fact, with some families, that might be a reward. Stop the nagging at least, mom. And, you know, some people like slap wrists. It's kinky. But being the professionals they are, they decide to split their tasks. Rick will work on getting the shutters to work, while Regina sweeps the ground floor looking for the not-so-dead doctor. The only door you can open from here is the management office, which is the game's first save room. That's despite being covered in blood and holding a corpse. Doesn't seem that safe to me. But it's packed with important things. A shotgun, which will be your primary weapon from here on. There's a code disc, which is the first of about a billion you'll have to pick up. DDK, which sounds like a mashup of Dance Dance Revolution and Donkey Kong, which would be awesome. Better than that Mario one they did. I'll explain these very soon. You also pick up a plug. Again, give me some time, guys. There's also a panel key too. There's a safe in here, but uh, we don't know the code for it yet. Who knew there could be so much stuff in a tiny little office? Finally, there is a switch on the wall that makes the computer turn on instantaneously. That and PCs were hardcore in 1999. This computer is only here to try and explain the DDK system, which is one of the primary puzzles of this game, as you need two sister keys to allow you to work out the code for a door. You've grabbed one already, and the other not too far away in an adjacent room. You now have the input disk and the code disk for H, but we don't know which door it's for yet. By the way, reading is really important in this game. To those who are adverse to things of a wordy nature may want to look elsewhere for your entertainment because this goes a bit old school. The game often forces you to remember or write down codes that you come across in journals and whiteboards. If I was the boss of this facility, I would fire their asses for writing down so much important secretive information. But you know, handy for an agent such as myself. So now I've got the code for the safe that we just passed, so let's grab that. Casually walking past the Velociraptor Prowl in the corridor. It's here I notice the rather good environmental storytelling. A minute ago I said I didn't feel safe in the save room because of the dead body and blood everywhere, but there is a story here. If you look into the corridor going into the room, you may have noticed blood smeared all over the place with bloody handprints on the door. This dude massively wounded, crawled into the save room before succumbing to blood loss. That's a nice little touch, especially from this era. It wasn't necessary, but it added to the atmosphere. A bit of backstory and a bit of humanity. You can just imagine the terror this guy went through. Anyways, the safe. Inside, we get the key for the main entrance, which seems like the next place of interest, so let's go there. One interesting mechanic that's used sparingly in the game are the laser shutters. The very thing Rick was trying to fix. Well, he fixed it. You can now flick these on and off via the little switch on the walls. Now, dinos may have learned how to open doors, but the nails are longer than a receptionist at the local tanning salon, so it appears they can't press the tiny little buttons on the wall. Instead, they ram into the lasers over and over again. I don't believe it can kill them or even hurt them, but at least it stops them from hurting you. We'll come across these a fair bit in our little adventure, but uh, I use them just sparingly. They're good for popping free shots at dinosaurs, but one thing I know about this game, the ammo is super, super limited, so I prefer to just run away and live to get mauled another day. In the front entrance, there is an eerie quietness about the place. Aside from the ragged corpse at the end, that is. He's holding another DDK file as well as an an aid, which uh, was very difficult for me to just say. But in Dino Crisis, there is a mixing mechanic, which is super important. You'll find various upgrades for both health restoration and your ammo to improve their effectiveness. In this example, I had some sleeping darts, and I mixed them with the anesthetic aid, which makes it more potent and last longer. You may think that sleeping darts are quite pansy compared to a shotgun blast to the face, but don't be foolish. They are super important later on, when they can put down the most beastly of dinosaurs in one shot. At least, briefly. Wandering around, looking elsewhere, there is an ominous munching sound as a raptor finishes his lunch.
legging it past we come across a radio antenna thing, which is important later on, but there is a file here with a tasty little password alongside an explanation of the kind of word puzzle we're going to be coming across soon. In the lounge area, there's a raptor just having a snooze, as you do. He's more pissed at you for waking him up than actually wanting to eat you. And there's nothing much inside here aside from a safe for the code we just got and it includes some custom gear for your handgun. That's another thing, this game doesn't have many weapons, in fact it only has 3 weapons in total, but there are plenty of upgrades for them. It's a pity there are so few unique weapons and those upgrades don't feel like significant, but I doubt this place was expecting dinos to invade and so they didn't prepare much weaponry in advance. A handgun, a shotgun, a grenade launcher, they'll have to do. Anyways, now it's time to finally use some of our Dance Dance Donkey Kong keys. So we're greeted with this screen, the code at the top and the key at the bottom. This is the simplest version of the puzzle and you need to take the bottom letters out of the top code and you will get the code that you need. So if you take B, C, F, G, I, you'll end up with H, E, A, D. And that is the real password. And that's obviously really easy, but they do make them really tough later on by adding another layer of complexity. So this is the chief's room and Lord Almighty, there is a survivor. Now, Dino Crisis, as a series, not exactly a fan of subtitles, so I can barely understand what they're saying over the overbearing music, but I gather that Regina lies through her teeth and says she is a rescue worker. He gives you a card key before passing away. Now we have two similar keys of a type called panel key, and if you fiddle around with a panel in the office and insert them into it, you get asked to put in a code, which uh, I have to be honest, stumped me because I hadn't seen any code that I hadn't used already. I thought, okay, Maybe I need to come back later after I spot it, or maybe I missed a secret document. I'll come back. Holy crap! Oh, I mean, I knew this was coming, but just not this second, and I genuinely bobbed myself. I tried to make a run for it, but my man T-Rex chomped me up good. Thankfully, despite being swallowed whole, I have a resuscitation device which means I don't actually lose a life. Of which, on normal mode at least, you are only allowed 5 true deaths. But thankfully, the resuscitation device takes you out of the T-Rex's stomach and back in time before you went into the office. Why don't hospitals have this technology? They could have saved your granddad before you got hit by the bus. Poor thing. Anyways, this time I managed to spot something on the two panel keys that I have, and I noticed one says Leo, one says Sol. If you put them together, you get a Pokemon. No, wait. Flip them upside down and you got a code. 705037. A simple puzzle, but I like it. It makes it fairly clear to see, but still requires observation on the player's part. And now they will know they can't always rely on morons writing codes on walls and not-so-secret diaries although mostly you will. So the T-Rex you won't be shocked to hear isn't killable even with a shotgun, but you can annoy him enough that if you shoot him when he opens his mouth, it'll probably make him want to sneeze or something, and then he buggers off for the time being, allowing you to get away with the new keycard you just got labeled L. Lot of keycards in this game, lot a lot of keycards. Rick calls you and say that he spotted a non-lizard shaped figure hanging around the training room, currently near your position. On the way there, you get introduced to a fun little panicking scene where you get surrounded by two raptors on each side. A little switch, perfectly placed at the perfect time, it sprays the raptors in a bit of slapstick comedy, so now you can laugh after you've bobbed yourself. Sadly, as far as I know, this isn't used again in the game, which is a pity because I do like the idea of using the environment to fight back rather than your guns or just legging it, but sadly that idea isn't realised too much here. In the training room, we get another panic moment. Picking up the key to the basement generator, you get cornered and even have a danger moment. This is where you're supposed to panic and smash every button you can to get out of it. It's a bit like a quick time event, but it's not so obvious. You just smash any button. This one, you won't die because someone is here to save the day. Gale. The dude's alive. Although I do suspect he may be a clone because he doesn't seem to know what dinosaurs are. That's no lizard. It's a dinosaur. Dinosaur? Look. Have you seen Jurassic Park or, you know, being a child? He buggers off to go find Rick as he needs his radio to be fixed. I still think he's gonna be a bad guy. It's obvious. He's well dodgy. I guess we have to go to the basement and turn on the generator. 
In the meantime, we get some backstory thanks to a file in the office which states that three years ago there was an accident at this very facility which had to do with third energy. It killed scores of researchers and so security has been ramped up. And then it mentions to be wary of fake IDs which have been popping up recently. Hmm, I wonder if that's a foreboding for later. There's even a computer in here with ID card stuff but that's for much later in the game. Wow, this game is really ramping up. It's going on full panic torture here. So yeah, the basement generator is near the beginning of the game. We have another generator puzzle in here which brings it to life. Rick calls you but you can't hear Jack since the generator is growling away. I think he wants you to go back to him and yes, yes he does. Gale spots someone on the underground camera and Gale wants to go check it out. But at the same time, Regina gets a distress call from someone on the team. They don't know who it is, could be either Tom, the agent who was already there, or Cooper, who's already in the T-Rex's belly. They don't know that, but for me, unless the T-Rex took an earlier than expected dump and then just stood on the watch, it's probably not Cooper. Gale wants to prioritize the mission of extracting Dr. Kirk, who could be in the underground, while Rick thinks it's better to save the distressed colleague. They have a bit of a fight about it, nothing like a bit of drama. At this point you have one of the most interesting parts of the game, the choice. At a handful of sections in the game, you can choose which mission you want to take. It's not exactly a branching path as they often lead to the same outcome, but they do offer a different experience in what you'll have to do at that particular point. It's great for replayability. For this choice, I decided to go with Rick, because Gale seems like a bit of a knob. And even though I have no desire to help anyone aside from myself, I thought Rick would be bearable compared to being with the dude that's obviously going to turn into some sort of tyrant superhuman thing. I've played Resident Evil before, he's got Wesker written all over him. So Rick is all about helping someone, either Tom or the half-digested Cooper. The distress signal is shown on the map. It's basically the part where we enter the facility at the start. We see Rick going on ahead in the corridor filled with raptors, which I do what he probably did and just run past them. Definitely the best option in this game. This leads to one of the coolest scenes in the game, where it introduces you to by far and away the most annoying enemy in this game and its sequel, the Pterodon, the Pterosaur, Pterodactyl, whatever you want to call him. And the big old bugger snatches you up and makes you drop your weapon. After fanning around, picking it back up and then finding the correct door, you will be safe. I believe you can shoot them down, but good luck aiming properly. You'd have better luck shooting a shooting star. You find Tom wounded. He tells us Kirk is insane and that his experiments have nothing to do with energy. He gives us something before passing out. Looks like another DDK with its sister key sitting on the side. How convenient. That is a bit of a gripe about this game. Things tend to be where they are needed. Here is a key. I will use this key on this door here. Kind of makes the environment feel much smaller than it actually is. I mean, it does save on backtracking, but makes the puzzle seem a bit pony at times. A puzzle that isn't pony, however, is this one. This looks massively complicated and there's no real puzzle explanation that I saw, but you have to press six switches to connect three pipes together. Because they're so poorly designed and intertwined with each other, you have to lay them down in a specific order. I like it. So that's the elevator powered on, which goes to the lower floors and you can take Tom down with you. Not before another pretty awesome panic scene where the pterodon grabs you and attempts to dump you in the now active fans. But he fails and is so embarrassed he flies in it himself. Pterodon Seppuku. Down in the basement we are greeted by a classic crate moving puzzle, especially from the safety of a crane. Again, just like every first time of a new puzzle type, this one is kind of easy, but I do like the approach to this one, even if it's not entirely believable. You don't control the crane directly, you program commands in, then you execute them. Because capital punishment is still legal in the coding world. Like you have to input the moves together, rather than one at a time. It takes a bit of getting used to, but it's not so bad. There's a way worse one later on. With the way clear, Tom and Rick go on ahead because they're faster. Oh no, it's because the writer wanted to kill Tom and they didn't want you to be there. Yeah, Tom and Rick wake up another napping raptor, which is starting to prove my theory that cats are in fact just highly evolved and lazy dinosaurs. They love a good snooze. Tom pushes Rick out of the way to take the munch to the face and he's dead, he's gone. So in a narrative sense, this was 
utterly pointless, aside from a way to get you into this place where you pick up an ID card. Useful. This card was supposed to be handed over to Colonel Clay, who I assume is the ranking officer of Sergeant Slime, Private Putty, and you know, serving under General Goop, of course. He's a Major Ball Buster. Or is he serving on the base as well, Major Ball Buster? Oh no, that's Major Ball Lake. It's easy to get them confused. It says this will allow the card holder to access the strategy room, where all the lads can bring their Warhammers out. It actually looks more like they had a legendary session of battleships, but we're here because we picked up the fingerprint scanner, alongside a document telling you exactly how to create false IDs. Yeah, there's a nice report on the table, laying it all out for you. It even mentions, hey, how about finding a corpse instead of a living person? No one would suspect a thing as a six foot bearded bastard turns up as Janice, the 60 year old humpbacked cleaner, who just tripped over a vacuum cleaner cord into a laser fence. It is seamless, so maybe we can create the false ID to get us somewhere else. If you need a reminder, with Tom dead, we still have a mission to accomplish and that is to find the good doctor. I don't believe the game leads you very well to the next point of progress at this time. Maybe there was a file I missed or a piece of dialogue, but the idea is to get into the labs. Maybe that's where the doctor is. But we're not allowed in the labs because we don't have clearance, even with the card we just picked up. Thankfully, just outside the lab elevator, the corpse of choice is there for us. Someone in a researcher's outfit. It looks like he might have ID for it, right? So we use the scanner to scan his remaining hand, take it to the ID computer we already passed, and recycle our current card. There's no wastage here, they're on a budget goddammit. These billion dollar energy facilities can't run without a few sacrifices. That's why the drinking water is just a little bit yellow. It's fine as long as you don't drink the bits at the bottom. I do like this aspect of the game, it's used a couple of times, and it involves not only finding the right corpse, but also their corresponding ID number. You can't just use their fingerprints, there's detective work, also known as reading. This could be quite tough to work out for the impatient or illiterate, but if you find this bloke called Paul, rest in peace, his ID number is plastered on a whiteboard. It's pretty cool and leaves you to work it out for yourself, so you can update that and now we are ready to delve into the labs. But the game's not done making you bob your pants, as a raptor is somehow in the shaft. At this point, I have really no idea what I'm doing aside from trying to find Kirk. It's hard to think clearly when there's a raptor chasing you, but this one has a sense of decency, because he's happy to wait while you solve a puzzle to open a door. So kind of him, must be British. This one, I didn't even need to think about the solution, because my eyes just instantly saw it standing out. The password to the laboratory is... Laboratory! It's genius! So the password to the head of the facility's office is head, and the password to the laboratory is laboratory. It's at this point I decided to kill my very first dinosaurs. I'd been wounded, I was bitter and angry, and there they were, two raptors conveniently behind a laser shutter, sitting ducks. And I tell ya, I was happy I'd waited until this point, mainly down to how much ammo it used up just killing these two. Although I think that may be because when they run into the lasers, they have some invincibility frames, which means bullets don't do anything to them. I think I may have wasted quite a few bullets at this point. We get a bit more story bait in the journal here. I, I hope you're reading everything, otherwise you'd have no idea what's going on at this point. But anyways, the third energy could eradicate the world's problems. But importantly, a scientist suspects that Dr. Kirk has a secret laboratory somewhere in this facility. Now I'm thinking something like being John Malkovich, probably hiding in a filing cabinet somewhere. So, probably looking for this secret lab, a clue to which may be in the library. It's like the Da Vinci Code in here. It's an emergency, let's go to the library. But forget all that because there is a survivor who somehow trapped himself in a gas chamber, as you do. While I'm not going to question what reason this place exists, we want to lower the gas amount so we can get him out safely and even allow us to enter. And so you have to fiddle around with these buttons, which is your classic puzzle style, of which I didn't really understand, so uh, after a bit of a disco, I, I gassed him. Uh, sorry mate. I've managed to kill two dinosaurs and one scientist so far. That's not a great ratio, gotta be honest. 
I did panic at this point and I did look online to see if I could really save him and yes, you can really save him. But he dies pretty quickly on his own accord afterwards. One may say he was dead set on being dead. Apparently you only get a small bonus item if he survives 5 minutes extra to give it to you. In order to bring equilibrium to the universe, just as you're leaving the chambre de gas, someone is a bit eager to get in on the action. Trap that dino in there and teach it a lesson. You can either leave it there to presumably starve to death, or play the sadistic veterinarian and put that poor lizard to sleep. It was for his own good. He'd have only suffered 25 more years. Don't forget to write that $3,000 check on your way out. At this point in the library, we are introduced to a new kind of puzzle that's presented to us thanks to the key card from the scientist we gassed. Yes, I'm including you in the blame too. It's a copy the pattern thing, but you must move two pieces at a time. This unlocks a safe, which gives us another key card. This unlocks the secret lab that Dr. Kirk is supposedly in. Forget Shinji Mikami, I'm pretty sure Oprah was the director of Dino Crisis 1. Except the programmer misunderstood her instructions. Instead of giving away loads of car keys, he gave a load of key cards. You know, the Japanese lost in translations. Unfortunately, for security reasons, both cars need to be slid in at the same time. But luckily, Gale is on hand to solve the man problem. This is where the word puzzles are leveled up a bit. Gotta protect that secret lab. It took a good while to figure out what to do, but it's a good job I read the file explaining it. They're so thoughtful to spies. Inside the secret lab, there is no Dr. Kirk. Instead, there is a wibbly wobbly space vortex just chilling. Switching it off as though you have any idea what you're doing, there is another note that explains the experiment was a success, but giant creatures emerged and the scientist said he'd be safe on the bottom floor. So he's gone even deeper. As we exit, an emergency warning goes off as Gale suspects that Kirk tripped the security system and you are locked in. This is just a quick tangent as you need to do another puzzle, perhaps the most difficult one of the lot of them. I'll give credit where it's due, Dino Crisis is not afraid to throw the brain teasers at you and I really appreciate that. This is a tricky puzzle that's also used a couple of times. You need to align these three pieces, lay them on top of each other in order to copy the sample at the bottom. Maybe you think, oh that's so easy, but actually it's not because firstly you have to rotate each piece and also parts of it will cover the ones you've already laid down. It's not like there's one formation where everything fits perfectly far from it. Just when you think you've got it, you put down the final piece and it ends up covering one vital part of the track you just laid down. This took me about five minutes to figure out, which is a lot for a puzzle in this game. Usually it's like one or two minutes, but this required a lot of retries to make it fit properly. Next, we have another choice, another fork in the road that leads back to the same road. And again, it's thanks to an argument between Gale and Rick. Rick says the underground area is now crawling with dinosaurs and you should go through the emergency hatch in the secret lab, which is password locked. Gale, being the bro that he is, just suggests blasting your way through. Gotta be honest, I've been playing like a coward so far and I do fancy relieving some stress. Plus my dinosaur to scientist kill ratio won't look good on my report card. So uh, yeah, need to fix that a little bit. But uh, well, then I kind of got scared of using too much ammo and goddamn Rick wasn't messing around with the amount of raptors hanging around here. After getting mauled a couple of times, we finally bump into the man himself, Dr. Kirk. I didn't really know where I was supposed to be heading. I ran like a headless chicken, but seemingly ended up in the right place. That's always nice. With Gale escorting him off, you grab his elevator keycard, which allows you to enter the communications room. It's time to leave, and you need to call in the chopper. You prep the antenna, then go back to the communication room to call in your chopper bud, but uh, then uh, the doors lock and... Uh... Gina, what happened? The emergency lock on the second floor has just been activated. I'm a bit busy right now. Do something about it. Don't sweat it. I'll release the lock. No, 
Now, that looked pretty easy. Just shoot the T-Rex when it opens its mouth. That's a life policy everyone should live by. But actually, <laughs> I died twice here, using up precious resuscitation kits along the way. In fact, I got my first proper death because I ran out of kits. But it's almost over, right? We've called in the chopper. The game's almost done, yeah? Hmm. It's a race to the heliport. The music ramps up to make it feel more rushed than it actually is. There is a corridor chase with raptors, then a box pushing puzzle. But not before picking up a grenade launcher, our third and final weapon. Why are we getting a grenade launcher just as we're finishing the game? Finally. You know, I had a really bad feeling about this mission. All things considered, it could have been a lot worse. That's odd. Something must have those animals spooked. All right, because it's a helicopter in a Capcom game. We all know what that means. Never be a helicopter pilot in a video game. It never ends well. You will die at some point. Speaking of dying, we get a comedy runaround like Benny Hill. Seriously, I would add the music, but I don't want YouTube to ruin my life, so I'll just do like an a cappella version. <laughs> Something like that, right? I don't know if you're supposed to fight it because I can't imagine having anywhere near enough ammo to do anything. But if you're just giving the runaround for a couple of minutes, Rick pops up and says, Hey, you idiot, go in this door. Obviously. Now, Kirk's buggered off. We don't know where Gale is. Our ride off this rock is cooking the finest barbecue this side of the Atlantic. And best of all, the power's out. Despite just being free, the game decides it needs to be longer than three hours, so it's going to peg us down to our Nadia. Yes, our lowest point. So the idea, thanks to yet another note left by a corpse, is that there is a port on B3. Maybe there's like a boat in there or something that we can take. You're finding this out by being attacked by the fourth dinosaur enemy, the Compi. Good old Compies, I always think of Jurassic Park 2. Taking that dickhead down while he's taking a piss. Love it. Anyways, we are underground for the final two hours of this game, and we are introduced to the final new enemy of the game, this tanky prick. These will supersede the raptor as the main enemy, and they are a pain in the arse, because they look slow and dumpy, like an ankylosaurus or something, but no, they are more difficult to run past than raptors, and they hit hard, and they take bullets like a champ. Even the sleeping darts don't last long on them. They would be awesome at raves, they wouldn't need to take any speed to keep going, they're fine. After another way more complicated and brain melting crane puzzle, we've got another Dance Dance Donkey Kong Key. Yeah, we may be in a completely different part of the facility, but that's not stopping us from having to deal with these word puzzles. I just think Colonel Clay enjoys brain teasers. Somebody should have got him Carol Vordam and Sudoku on the PS2, might have chilled out a bit. So this whole part of the facility seems to be like the visitor entry part, as well as for receiving materials via cargo ship. So it's very lab-like in that sense, very sterile and military, perfect for the anal bureaucrats that obviously run this place. All your goddamn notes and memos. After pissing around a bit, getting mullered once or twice by raptors and the big bastards, I got enough keys to get into the immigration room. Which reminds me of going through Chinese customs, just with a few extra raptors, as I'm trying to dodge a suitcase search. It's always me though, let's pick on the little white dude, he won't make a fuss. This is where the boat is on the other side of the door, but it's locked, again. Thankfully, a nearby corpse lights up with a walkie talkie. Another survivor saying they have the key to the port and they will meet him at the bottom of the large elevator. They are being hounded by lizards. Now, considering this dude's only current priority on this earth is decomposing, he is not in much of a rush to meet them at the place they said, so maybe we can go. Obviously, this game isn't keen on any surviving scientists living more than a few seconds after we meet them, but we don't even get that courtesy because as the elevator opens, the T-Rex pops out to say hello and then promptly knocks himself unconscious. I didn't show that because it's a lot of 
flashing white lights and I don't want to like give people epilepsy, all right? I care about yeah. He ain't dead, he's just knocked out for a bit. It's fine, we all get excited from time to time. Inside the cargo elevator, it's obviously a bit of a bloodbath. Three torn up scientists, which is sad we never got to meet them, but at least we get to loot their still warm corpses. Most importantly for the key to the port, we can get out of here. But it's bad news because there is another infuriating blockage and I ain't talking about the stuffed toilets. I'm talking about the wibbly wobbly vortex which is in the least convenient place possible. So inconsiderate. If this was in England, people would passively aggressively tut it out of existence. But sadly, I think these guys are American. They only have guns to show their displeasure. Need to learn how to tut guys, okay? So we need to figure out a way to deactivate it. There's yet more. Put this key card in here, put this one in there, get this one, do this over there until we get to the third energy area. The place where the experiments were conducted. Upon entering here, Rick asks you if you can activate it. Whoa, whoa, did I miss like a piece of information? Why are we wanting to turn it on? I thought turning it off would get rid of the wibbly wobbly vortex. I don't know, these guys are crazy. I don't feel comfortable taking control of their actions. It doesn't help that this section, this part of the facility, it's tighter than my dad's wallet. Pay for your granddaughter's kindergarten fees, damn it. There's little space, loads of doors, stairs, and it's super easy to get lost or just forget which part leads where. Anyways, you find out through files that only Kirk's ID can actually activate the generator, which is obviously quite important. Is he like the Emperor or something? Why is he only... what? What about Colonel Clay? General Goop? Why don't they have access? Yeah. Wandering around, I actually got quite a shock. There is another survivor, a lady scientist this time, but all we get is she's unconscious and she's dying. Well, alright then, that seems quite pointless. Then one of the most important files of them all, the one that gives us the biggest piece of information, Kirk's ID number. With this we can forge his ID card. Now we just need his prints. After fiddling about the power and the system lock, we get an error message saying we really need that dude's key card. Regina, in a moment of anger, smacks the keyboard so hard a bullet fires off in the neighborhood. Control your anger, young Padawan. The dying woman was just randomly murdered with a comical amount of blood. I still haven't worked out why this happens, but she was nice enough to leave a memo before she died apparently. They're so thoughtful. There's a code on the paper, and we see the shadiness of Kirk legging it. Being rather amateurish, Regina gets ambushed by the good professor, and just as he's about to pull the trigger, Gale comes in to save the day. Thanks, Gale. I still think you're going to be a bad guy, but you brought me back a little bit. You got me back a little bit. He gives out a good old exposition dump about how third energy can replace one pocket of existence with one from a different time. These dinosaurs aren't in the wrong place, they're in the right place just 65 million years in the future. Which, uh, I don't want to get all scientific on you guys, but uh, Velociraptors were already extinct 65 million years ago, as were T-Rexes, give or take. T-Rexes and Velociraptors, they did not hang out together, let's just say that. There was no Monday Night Football, there was no bi-weekly D&D, and not only because of time but also space because they couldn't have lived any further apart, really. What I'm trying to say is Dino Crisis is not scientifically correct, and I'm, I'm sorry for ruining that for you. He says if we want to stop the wibbly wobbly vortex, we need to overload the system. We need the system's initializer and the stabilizer. But Gale and Rick come to loggerheads once again. Gale says to go pick them up from the area that we were told, but Rick says it's too dangerous again, maybe they can build them from scratch. Forget that, I'm not a scientist ponce, I can't even change a light bulb without burning myself, I'll choose the pre-made ones thanks. Before going there, I decided to get ahead of the curve and do some good old identity fraud and take his prints in advance. So yeah, the option I choose is kinda like the last one, probably the quicker but way more dinos in your path. And boy did I suffer for it. Even when bringing out the pain of flame rounds and the like, I'm just getting clobbered left, right and centre. But just about alive when I find myself in the room with the access to the stabiliser and initialiser. Now I just have to go all the way back. So I'm half dead with no healing items left and the same amount of dinos I just passed to get through. And yeah, yeah, I'm a late afternoon snack. 
Thankfully, I do have a resuscitation kit, which means I can start at full health just outside the door that murdered me, giving me a really fair chance, and uh, I got killed again. But I've played well up until now, so I have a good few of those to cover me. On the way back, remember I still need his ID card, so I go to the security room, which I've passed through like a half a dozen times at this point. This has an ID card rewriter. I've got his ID number, and now I've become Dr. Kirk. Suddenly I have the urge to not give the monkeys about anything other than being the cleverest person in the world. I can now set the initializer and the stabilizer, and after you do that the game sort of gives up on you because it literally takes care of what you're supposed to do for the next couple of minutes. It doesn't trust you after almost five hours. You overload the reactor and things start to go a bit mental. Gale is crushed by the ceiling after pushing the asset out of harm's way. Kirk says something but you can barely hear it over the noise and rushing back to Gale, he gives you a tracking device he's stuck onto Kirk but you bugger off straight to Rick in the disembarkation room with Gale, somehow. I feel like we missed a scene or something, I don't know. They were on a budget. According to Rick, the only thing left is their escape but of course, Rick and Gale being chalk and cheese, Gale has other ideas so you have one final choice and it's this that will affect the ending that you get. There are three endings but only two choices. You can either bonk Gale on the head and force him to get on the boat or you can choose to do your duty and choose to go after Kirk one last time with Gale. Let me lay the outcomes out to you. If you do as the game says for each of these, knocking out Gale will mean that he survives but Kirk will die on the island and you won't have achieved your original mission. But if you go with the other option, if you go with Gale and do as the game says, you will get Kirk, but Gale will die in the process. So you're basically choosing Gale or Kirk at this point. To be frank, it's hard to give a shit about either of them. And even Rick. I don't even care about Rick and he's definitely living. But there is a slightly, slightly secret ending where you can save both of them. I'm led to believe this is the canon ending for reasons I might get into with Dino Crisis 2. I don't know, I haven't written it yet. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Instead of going straight away to follow Gale tracking Kirk, you can go to a place we haven't been up to this point. Now we have a super duper access card we can get to here. Off the beaten track, down some super weird transportation area, we find a helicopter. That sounds much nicer than a boat. So that now means when you meet Gale and Kirk, you mention the helicopter and that news alone apparently means he won't die of his wounds. Good news can cure death apparently. Maybe he has a fear of boats and that's what's sent him over the edge. Death before seasickness, yo. Anyways, there's this bit of side comment from Gale thanking Kirk for the disc, which confuses Regina and confused me, but I'll talk about that in a second. With Kirk and Gale in the chopper, for some reason, you have to go meet Rick halfway to the helipad as though he's like a 10-year-old walking home from school. Did you have a good day? Did your drama teacher try to touch you again? But someone's here to spoil the party. He may have conked himself out, but now he's back. The final boss. A fairly cool chase sequence where, well, what else should you have to do but shoot him in the mouth. It's actually quite tough and I died a few times because I couldn't get the timing right, but eventually he gives up, he's eaten too many people, that's easily a couple of pounds around the waist, and the final cutscene begins. Congratulations, you've just got the best ending in the game. You're flying home with a psychopathic scientist, a half-dead work-obsessed soldier and a wisecracking computer geek who suddenly can fly a chopper. Wonderful. And the credits roll. Well done, Dino Crisis 1 is done.
We get told that Kirk is currently negotiating with the government to start his experiment up again. Uh, uh, alright, should we have left him on the island? Gale is currently receiving medical care, and Rick is decoding data, the absolute geek. Have a vacation, get laid! And Regina, while well, she's ready for the next mission, she probably gets laid enough. And with that, we've unlocked a bonus mode. Oh yeah, if you complete the game fast enough, you will unlock Operation Wipeout, which has you running over obstacle courses and falling into water. Uh, not really. You just have to kill dinosaurs. It's more like an arcade mode with a few missions. Kill the amount needed and then make it back to the start before the timer runs out. Quite difficult. But I just did it to admire the new costume I'd unlocked as well. There are three unlockable costumes, but one of which you need to complete the game a second time. I'm dedicated, but uh, I'm not that dedicated. All right. And that's Dino Crisis 1 finished, and I will give you my thoughts and analysis on it. But first, I would like to thank my Patreon supporters. Thank you for supporting me. They get these videos early, completely ad-free. They get behind-the-scenes videos about my progress and smaller updates on a secret Discord. They also get an exclusive bonus video for each big video I make. Dino Crisis' bonus video is more Dino Crisis. I take a look at two spin-offs. Dino Stalker, and Dungeon in Chaos. It's available to watch right now. And if you're in the producer position, you can vote for things like what video I work on. Patreon is the best way to support me, and it allows me to dedicate more time to these videos. I would love to do this full-time someday, but uh, I have a full-time job, a family, and three YouTube channels, of which this is the smallest one. But uh, I wish it was the biggest, so check the links below. I think it's worth it. But with that, let's jump into the analysis. Dino Crisis 1 for me stands up as an unusual game. I'm not sure I'd call it an all-time classic because I honestly believe it's a game that could have offered even more. It's a game and series with so much potential and having played it once more for the first time in two decades, I really couldn't believe the way in which the game developed and progressed through the five or six hours of playtime. It doesn't go the way you'd expect it to go or at least ask the player to do things they'd be expecting. And I do applaud that. Dino Crisis had the potential to be a blockbuster crowd pleaser, but instead, they wanted to make the game they wanted to make by making it a key card swapsies simulator. I love it. First and foremost, Dino Crisis, aside from being a survival horror game, it's a puzzle game. There's such a huge focus on the puzzle aspect, at no point are you ever not doing some sort of puzzle. Whether it be decoding one of the DDKs, rewriting ID cards, putting the right item in the right place, or when you have to pause the game to do your tax returns and try to commit fraud without looking like you're committing fraud. What a puzzle that is. Coffee's work related. Write it down. Write it down. There's a wild variety in the actions you need to do. It's just a pity they all mostly revolve around key cards. This is Key Card Generator, the game. You need more dodgy IDs than school kids trying to get served in a pub. And don't get me started on all the panel keys and DDKs. In that regard, as much as I enjoyed playing this game, I don't think I'd have the urge to play it again anytime soon. Maybe another two decades later. I juggle enough keys in real life. Got my house keys, got my car keys, my classroom keys, my secret Mila Jovovich shrine key. It's a lot to keep up with. When I'm walking, I jingle more than that Christmas song. It's not fascinating enough to do it more in a video game. I love the puzzles themselves, I just think they could have eased off in the card key aspect of them. Maybe they could have involved something other than those at all times possible. Going here, finding this key, popping it in here, swapping it for that one, it did get tiresome by the end mile. I do appreciate that although they reuse some puzzle mechanics, specifically the crane, the layered pipes, and the tower of power, at least that's what I'm calling it, can't only be my nickname, it's very purposeful on Dino Crisis to use each of them only twice. Firstly, it means they're not wasted, but it also means they can add significant difficulty to the progression of the game in an easy way for the development team. Balancing difficulty in games is really, really hard, which is ironic, but it's true. Gradually increasing the pressure to put on the player, the challenge, takes a lot of trial and error. Because developers know their games inside out, for them, by the time the game is coming together, they can speedrun the whole thing without taking damage, probably, and it's hard for them to judge. 
And even if not, they're experienced enough gamers that they might have skewed either way by making it difficult for them or reducing it so low there's less curve than a plank of wood wearing a maxi dress. Balancing is not easy and that's why playtesters are used so much, especially in this day and age where gamers need the controller picked up and handed to them by someone else. And even when you know about difficulty curves, how to implement them in your game style? Well, Dino Crisis uses a variety of methods, from increasing the amount of enemies, the enemy toughness, but the easiest one of all, puzzles. You can always notch up the puzzles a bit more, and that's why reusing the aforementioned puzzles, but bumping them up so slightly, is great for both parties, developers, and gamers. And they're not overused. Twice per puzzle variety shows a massive amount of restraint on the developer's part because we know from many other games that have like a unique mini game or puzzle aspect that they spent time developing, they sure as hell want to make the most of it, often to the game's detriment. I mean, how many games a decade ago had overused hacking mechanics? Dino Crisis 1 respects your time and sanity with these puzzles. I also massively applaud the notion of reading. Reading is a super underrated skill in 21st century, but uh, there's plenty of flavor text in Dino Crisis. But it's actually flavor that is really important. It's probably salt, because that is quite important. Reading documents not only to find background tidbits of lore and story, but those nuggets of vital information, codes, ID numbers, where to look for certain things. It's so very important. And this is the kind of game those little note sections in the back of manuals what they were invented for. These days, games would specifically highlight the codes, make sure there was an on-screen pop-up saying, oh look, we found this code, and then highlight the door which you need it for. Where's the fun, the discovery in that? This makes you feel like an investigator, that you're using your deduction skills and your brain. That's massively rewarding. The game only highlights certain things to you. Specifically, if a character tells you to go somewhere, then it will show you on the map. But aside from that, Working out the fingerprints from this dude because you need it to use the elevator, that's entirely on you and you working it out. You can feel lost, you can feel a bit frustrated, but that's alright. And I think Dino Crisis got that balance extremely well. It's not as though you're under a time pressure to do any of these things. Sometimes, just like back in the day, if me and my dad were sitting playing this, we'd pass suggestions onto each other. That's nice. It's good bonding. The puzzles are great, even if they don't always revolve around an interesting thing, and perhaps not invite much incentive to replay the thing within a short space of time. But how about the supposed survival horror? If you're a survival horror fan, Dino Crisis absolutely nails it. I'd say it's one of the best examples of the genre because ammo in this game is very limited. From the beginning of the game, I made a pact with myself not to bother fighting most of the dinos unless absolutely necessary. I've been burned too many times in classic Resident Evil games where I've been begging for more ammo in certain spots. I wanted to conserve it here as much as possible. Outrunning raptors sounds like a dumb idea, but thankfully they're dumb enough to get walked past or at least have the turning circle of a Morris Minor, so I very rarely took them down, only at points where I knew I would get mauled if I didn't. And even then, when it came to the last stretches of the game and you got two of those armored bastards decking you to oblivion, I just wish I had more ammo because they take ages to go down. I can't imagine what it would have been like if I decided to fight more earlier on. That would have been super rough, in fact I think it might have made the game impossible. Also, health replenishments. I damn got worried at one point near the end where I didn't have any health restoratives at all. I kept thinking, oh I'm sure I'll pick up one soon, there's definitely going to be one coming up, surely, any time now. But no, I went ages without any means to heal up. Sure, I had plenty of resuscitation devices, which made me feel quite calm, but I'd rather not waste any of those unless I really had to. And I suppose that is a slightly overly generous way of helping the player. I think without these, it might have been one of the most hardcore survival games around with the current balance of health and ammo, plus the plight of only having five game overs before it's super duper game over. That's harsh. So I have a feeling the resuscitation devices were added a bit later on to balance things out more. Maybe they realized, hang on, this is a bit too severe of a game, so let's throw them a bone. I also really like that you didn't have a health bar or any kind of meter to indicate your situation. You literally have to guess and go on how Regina looks. Thankfully, she's slightly more on the nose about her current mood than, say, ooh, my wife, who I need mind reading capabilities to see how she's feeling. Uh, if she starts keeling over, you know what you gotta do. You don't need a health bar or a pulse checking machine. You just look at her, and I like that. I like looking at her. 
I mean, I, I like that she wears her wounds on her sleeve. It takes the video gameness out of it and it feels fresher. While life bars do offer something useful to the player, you can't deny that they don't add to the immersion at all, while this method, it does. I didn't like it at first, but I came to appreciate it over the course of the game, feeling like I'm using my own judgement in the situation, tricking me into thinking I'm using my brain, but no, if she looks like she's about to collapse, you just heal, it's obvious and almost binary in its simplicity. The spanner in the works is the bleeding mechanic, which I was worried about like becoming a big part of the game, but it's not. I think I only started bleeding twice in my five hours playing, which is less than I do in real life, I think. If I don't have a wound every two hours just from being a clumsy git, or nosebleeds from YouTube algorithmic stress, something's wrong. Each time I bled, I nipped it in the bud pretty quickly. Although saying that, after those two bleeds, there was a long period between finding the next hemostat. So things could have got a pretty spicy pretty quickly if I got bit on the wrong time. But that's another thing in favour of it being a great survival horror game. Inventory is an important aspect of survival horror. If you can carry anything you want at all times, it's hard to feel up against it. Dino Crisis 1 has a little twist in the inventory system. You can barely carry anything offensive. Only a few guns, ammo, same with defensive stuff. There's almost no room to have health packs along with the items used for mixing. You're always running into the problem of you can't carry any more items. There is a mechanic in this game which I didn't touch upon in the main section because well, I wanted it to flow better, but during your ordeal, you'll come across these boxes integrated into the wall. They can be opened up with plenty of plugs that you'll find along the way, which uh, look like the suppository I took one time for when I had ball ache for an entire year. That was fun. These boxes of corresponding colour are connected to one another. So green matches with green, and when you open them up, they already have stuff inside that you can take, or you can deposit stuff later. Green ones tend to have health items in, red has offensive stuff, like a manual on how to open a door for a lady, and yellow, I believe, is a mixture of the two. I'm not entirely sure since uh, I didn't use them a whole lot. It's the age-old problem of not wanting to blow your load so early. I was scared to use up all my plugs for when I really needed them, kind of like ammo. The problem being that when I really needed them, they were nowhere in sight, because they are hardly ten a penny. And my paranoia was unfounded because I found so many plugs along the way, I could have opened a butt plug shop with how many I had. I was rolling in them. I do find it funny how all the useful, offensive and healing items are limited in your inventory, but all the useless key items are unlimited. Like this lady knows how to store her key cards. She probably uses a Ridge wallet. Speaking of Ridge wallet, I would like to thank today's sponsor, which is not Ridge wallet because a, I'm not big enough, and B, I'm not desperate enough to try and sell you a wallet while I'm talking about retro games. Doesn't make sense, it's too much of a stretch. But hey, any companies out there to do with retro games or gaming in general? I'm open. I'm just not selling, like, perfumes or Japanese knives or online learning. <laughs> Don't learn, be dumb. The horror, the horror indeed, because coupling the survival elements just mentioned alongside classic horror techniques makes this a really tense and nerve-wracking game. I suppose if you're just casually running past raptors, it does lose that certain mystique about it. But you know, those girls lost their career in the mid-2000s, so you can't really blame them for Dino Crisis. So, so but aside from that, I think Dino Crisis is a pretty good scare fest because it mixes it up nicely. It has the atmosphere, it has the scare jumps, it has the pure terror, it's not a one trick pony. Although the atmosphere of apprehension lasts throughout the game, it's only really super prominent at the start, after you've only had a small smidge of an idea of what's going on on this island. Walking through the window corridor, hearing a bang, you're definitely on edge. And even though the atmosphere changes into a different form later on, once you've already had a thousand raptors swipe at you, it's still very effective. You're always on edge. You never know when you're going to walk in on a raptor taking a snooze, or when they're going to walk into you in a place you thought was safe. This game loves its jump scares, which I know many people think are cheap in both video games and movies, but it all depends on how you utilize them. And I think Dino Crisis gets away with it because they're not just boo, mage jump sort of thing. They all have gameplay attached to them in some capacity, whether it be mashing the button so you don't get hurt, or doing that and then having to deal with it in some fashion, there is a reason Capcom wanted to label this as panic horror rather than survival horror, because you will be panicking a lot, reacting to sudden shifts in danger. Both raptors, T-Rexes provide this constantly, 
always keeping you on your toes. It's one hell of a ride. Even when you are prepared for an event, it still may make you jump. Everyone who picked up a controller before the age of 30 knows about the T-Rex busting through the window. I knew it would happen, but I still kind of bobbed my pants when it did. I was always on the edge the entire time, and I hated it when I heard the clicking footsteps or when Regina looks over to a part of the room I can't see. It's just great. It blends survival horror almost perfectly with every aspect. Every piece of survival horror puzzle comes together very well indeed, but I do have some fairly minor ones. I mentioned the fact that the game revolves entirely around keys, so uh, I'll spare you that, but let me talk about other things that didn't work so well in Dino Crisis, at least for me. The story. Now the premise of the game is phenomenal. You're a paramilitary, you've been tasked with extracting a target from a facility on an island. The twist is, everyone on the island is dead, they've been eaten by dinosaurs. That's amazing. Now obviously they need to give an excuse for that, and wibbly wobbly time vortex was seemingly the best option from their viewpoint. And I do respect it. They could have gone the whole Jurassic Park thing, you know, mad capitalists wanting to bring dinos back on an island, billions worth of revenue, but they didn't. They made it a side effect of someone trying to create unlimited energy. Unfortunately, that's a bit boring. They tried to create intrigue with secret laboratories above even more super secret laboratories. Even the secret scientists don't know what the super secret scientists are up to. They tried to create more layers, but at the end of the day, Dinosaurs being a side effect of an experiment that just so happens to replace time 65 million years in the past, bit of a naff excuse. Personally, I would have preferred much more conspiracy. It doesn't work nearly as well as the equally stretch-worthy STARS mission of Resident Evil 1, but at least that's not a clumsy accident. I mean, it's lucky the experiment didn't make the vortex be in the ocean, at which point it would have created the biggest faucet in the history of the universe as the entire sea of the world 65 million years ago floods into modern day. Although perhaps some fat-ass plesiosaur could have clogged it up eventually. I think the story writer knew it was a bit boring because all the important bits are left in documents laying around, as though they put the backstory on the bench and preferred it if people just accepted that dinosaurs are here. Just deal with them and the current situation. We don't really need to know why. And that's probably to its benefit. I might have actually liked Dino Crisis even more if I didn't anally read all the documents because it's just kind of dumb. Dumber than just accepting dinosaurs randomly appeared on the island. I also have an issue with Gale. He's way too complicated of a character for this sort of thing. I don't know about you, but as soon as I saw this guy, I'm like, he's a bad dude. He is the Wesker of this game. He might not be massively involved in whatever conspiracy is here, but he's gonna turn on us in some fashion. He mysteriously disappears at the beginning of the game like he's pretending to be dead while he gets up to some shady stuff, but no, he's, well, he's not outright good because he loves the job too much. Who cares if you all get eaten, he's got a government to please. He's more than happy to put you in more danger than is needed, but he doesn't actually turn on you. In fact, he supports you all the way up to the very end. And yes, there is a small conspiracy in the fact that, depending on the ending, it turns out that Kirk wasn't all that important. The government just wanted his data disk with all his research on. Gale was told this in private, but it was news to you. He's an ambivalent character, he's not bad, he's not good, which is fine, but I don't know why they painted him up as such a bad dude who's obviously going to turn on you. I think first time players would definitely choose Rick's suggestions, like the mission choices, over Gale's just because they wanted to side with the good person. One major oversight for me are the boss battles, or should I say lack of them. Survival horror games need to have the occasional monstrosity to defeat. They can lead to being some of the most memorable parts of the game. Everyone remembers the snake from Resident Evil or Plant 42. Dino Crisis doesn't really have any. Unless you count trying to make the T-Rex sneeze by shooting it when its mouth's open, that's not a proper boss. There needed to be something more. Individual big dinos to take out in a unique way. I came up playing this really disappointed in that aspect. It felt like it was just missing the occasional climax. Now there is something that I kind of don't want to talk about, but I feel like I have to, and that is the music. I love video game music, I listen to it more than normal music. And I'm not proud to say this, but the music in Dino Crisis, 90% of it is awful. And I know the reason why, but firstly, there is some decent stuff in here, like the save room theme, that's really memorable, but then you have stuff like this.
Not only is the composition awful, but the instrumentation is awful too. Everything about it is terrible. And I think that's because they wanted to make the panic horror. The director said, give me panic horror soundtrack and the composer panicked and made this garbled garbage. It reminds me of that awful re-release of the Resident Evil 1 with the farty basement music, except this is even worse because it's obviously on purpose. Now four composers worked on this game and I'm shocked no one said, hang on a minute, does this sound a bit too shit? Now, you know, from one artist to another, I respect your vision. You know, we all have our artistic vision, but I'm worried that your vision has cataracts right now. It sounds shit. Maybe I'm being harsh on it since there are a handful of good tracks in here. It's just when things get panicky and supposedly dramatic, all of a sudden their recording studio gets raided by cats walking over everything. Now, despite all these criticisms, Dino Crisis, kind of a classic. Is it flawless? No. It does have its slightly more forgettable moments, but it's almost there. I can see why it didn't go into the stratosphere like Resident Evil, but it's so close. I think this should be a staple of anyone's gaming library. If zombies are too scary for you, then I highly recommend Dino Crisis. It's not a terrifying game, but it will make you jump on occasion and panic. Yes, panic horror really makes sense. Grab this for your PlayStation, or even better, on the Dreamcast. Because as you've seen from my Dreamcast footage, it looks great. They forewent the pre-rendered backgrounds in favour of real-time environments, and even though I am partial to gorgeously hand-drawn pre-rendered backgrounds, I think Dino Crisis looks superb on the Dreamcast. I am sure it looks worse on the original PS1, but this is crisp and clean and surprisingly detailed. And the fact that it's 20 years later, pre-rendered backgrounds would probably look super pixelated, but on here, big TVs, this one, it holds up remarkably well. The animation can be a little stiff at times. Well, except for when Regina's walking through a door, that's uh, that's never going to get old. In fact, if I wasn't married, I'd probably just make this my looping desktop background. I'm not entirely sure what dressing she's going for here, nor can I tell what kind of clothes she has on. Like, is it grey that sticks to her body? Or is it like see-through black and you can see her skin underneath? That's not an important question, but it's literally the only question that kept popping up in my head. She has an iconic design, that's for sure, even though I'm not sure what she's wearing. She may have only appeared in two games, but in my mind, she's just as recognisable as Jill Valentine. Although considering Capcom change her looks every five minutes after a lunch break, I guess that's understandable as to why. This lady hasn't appeared in a game for 20 years, and yet people still create fan art for her and cosplay as her, which is proof she has an enduring visual style. The striking red hair, it's iconic. And I guess people also enjoy her personality. I can understand why. While it's not a realistic portrayal of how someone would be in her situation, she has a bit of sass about her. Cool under pressure, she's like one of the lads. She can be ready for a bit of banter, even though she has a feminine side. And it's a shame we don't really see her character develop much at all, even in the sequel, but I'll get to that later. Or maybe I'll get to it now. Is that enough analysis of Dino Crisis 1? Dino Crisis 2! It wouldn't be long before the sequel to the smash hit would be released. Not one to miss an opportunity, Capcom released Dino Crisis 2 in almost record time, just slightly over a year after the original. In the year 2000, Dino Crisis 2 would appear on Sony PlayStation and PC. Sadly, no Dreamcast this time around. Dino Crisis 1 and 2 stand as shining examples of the divergent paths a series can take. Just as the fierce dinosaurs roam within these games, so too do the contrasting elements jump out to create two distinct experiences. The allure of survival horror in Dino Crisis 1 gives way to the pulse-pounding action and intense encounters in Dino Crisis 2. This is another beast entirely. Shinji Mikami was hands off for this one and it was instead directed by Shu Takumi, who's best known as the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney dude. Can you believe that? He actually played a big part in the first game's development as an event planner and it was produced by Hiroyuki Kobayashi, who's known for sticking his fingers in many a Capcom pie. He helped kickstart the Devil May Cry series and Sengoku Basara. 
Nice pedigree. But Dino Crisis 2 is where the boundaries of survival horror are shattered, giving way to a new breed of excitement. As the sun sets on your experience in the first game, you find yourself thrust into a world where the concept of time has been warped and the line between prey and predator blurs. While survival is still the key, perhaps the ancient beast will also be feeling that, because brace yourself for a relentless onslaught of raging raptors, tyrannical T-Rexes and piss-inducing pterodons. Piss off! Now equipped with the means to go out on the attack, the corpses of the dinos will be littering the battlefield. Dino Crisis 1 and Dino Crisis 2 are poles apart. How? Well, we'll delve deeper into that very soon. Why? Well, I can only speculate, but perhaps it serves as a great allegory to evolution. Just as dinosaurs became birds of today, the survival horror became an action game. Or they just didn't want to step on Resident Evil's toes too much and oversaturate an already faltering market. So let's make it an action game. Allegory, business sense. Take your pick. One year has passed since the third energy incident and the government has taken over Kirk's research. A huge facility was set up in the Midwest and without heeding the mistakes of Kirk's team, something has gone wrong in the facility. But not in the same way. This time, the research facility, a military base, and a nearby town have disappeared, completely vanished into thin air and replaced by a 65 million year old jungle. So pretty much the Midwest. An American geography joke by a British dude who has no idea about American geography. I don't care if there's no jungles in Chicago. Although I guess you could be pretentious and say it's a concrete jungle. I'm just trying to find a way not to delete that crap joke. Speaking of crap jokes... What's wrong with American geography? Who says this is the Midwest? That's the Midwest? Mid... West? Midwest? I don't, I don't care if it's historical. Americans just look hysterical. Call it like... I don't know. 2 p.m.? I'd say that's 2 p.m. That's the 2 p.m. region. Probably. It's better than Midwest. What have you been smoking? Oh, and there's a time traveling boat. Who needs a DeLorean? Regina has become a member of TRAT alongside series newcomer Dylan. They've been sent on this dinky little boat to bring 1,300 survivors back to the present day. This was not well thought out. And just as they're setting up base camp... Everyone is dead, aside from Dylan, Regina, and some tooting cowboy dude. Why is there always a cowboy in every team? I thought they were lone rangers or something. Dylan and Regina jump down a cliff to avoid being chomped. Now tonally, this is all a bit weird. There's a bit of joking about just as their entire team was massacred. And Dylan might be blind because he said his team are probably okay. And then Regina, she just buggers off. What? I get that this is to show off each character's different abilities in the fact Dylan can slash vines and Regina can have baby's first lightsaber, but come on, you're not going to work together? You go your separate ways for no reason at all. And well, let's just see how different this game is from the original. Dino Crisis is now a run and gun with points and combos and an almost endless amount of dinosaurs and ammo. What the goal is at the moment seems to be taking a backseat to Dylan having a good old time hunting raptors. If he was a dentist from LA, he'd be in heaven. He doesn't need to pay an African guy a lot of money to get skulls in his office. While there is a bit of exploration here and there in this game, you'll notice that it is super linear. The corridors are tight, there's no place to move around. If Contra was 3D and had Jurassic Park themed tie-in, it would probably have looked like this. You move from screen to screen, trying your best to eliminate the dinosaurs. The more dinosaurs you take down, the more points you get. Thankfully, these points aren't some useless legacy mechanics stuck on in a place it's not really needed. They are actually needed because you use them to upgrade your weapons and buy ammo. I'm not sure how that works in terms of like the game world, but whatever. I'll talk about that in a second because when you get to a certain point, the first big mystery of the game pops up. Yes, Dylan spots a survivor, or at least some biker girl legging it away from you, but she's gone. And she's probably a she because, you know, those hips don't lie. I've only been tricked a few times. So this little computer thing is the game's save point and weapon shop. 
Again, the realism was fine with wibbly wobbly time vortex T Rexes, but a tiny computer on the wall dishing out weapons and upgrades? You've gone too far, Mr. Phoenix, right, dude? If you can't make courts of law realistic, you're hardly gonna make a game with dinosaurs realistic, so any pretense of realism is out of the way with this sequel. So with this little computer, you can use the points you've accumulated by blasting dinos and using them to buy new weapons, which increase as you progress in the game. You can buy health items, magazines, sadly not of the dirty kind found on the top shelf of the news agents. It's to buy ammo for your gun or upgrade the size of the cartridge. And there's also tools which are extra things like improved armor, increasing your sub-weapon effectiveness. Personally, I wouldn't advise blowing your load too early. In fact, it's definitely best to upgrade just a little bit until you get later in the game when there are expensive but incredibly powerful weapons to buy instead. Buy those. Anyways, in pursuit of survivors or the biker girl from Mars, we get our first gameplay encounter with the T-Rex that spoiled the arrival party. You can see he's half blind now, which means he's probably extra grumpy. And now with his newfound lack of depth perception, his greatest enemy won't be a rocket launcher. We just need to find a staircase. This sucker be tumbling like an octogenarian who's had a few too many sherries at his great niece's wedding. There was one I'll get to spoil a party. Spoil the memories. You don't remember the cutting of the cake. You don't remember the vows or the first dance. All you remember are the flashing ambulance lights as Uncle Jeff gets wheeled off for an emergency hip operation. As we leg it, Dylan gets ambushed by some Sith Power Rangers firing off explosive frisbees. As you do, this dude can't catch a break. After taking refuge in the reception area filled with rampant raptors, because we know doctors waiting areas can make tempers flare, we grab a key and I stare at a locked door for about 10 minutes, wondering why this key won't work. Turns out, wrong door. I mean, it literally says Regina can open this door with a lightsaber, so uh, that's kind of embarrassing. I guess it's my fault for thinking that it might be a bit stupid to go back outside to a place where there's a T-Rex and futuristic Hell's Angels. Silly me. But if you do leg it out, you'll find another door that was the one I thought I actually went in. But uh, no, using the key I picked up, I swapped it for a research facility key. Oh God, not, not key cards again. And thankfully, the game panics and locks Dylan down so we can't get out. At which point he calls on Regina for help, who goes on full biatch mode. Did you swing your precious machete around? Well, I guess I can help you out. Over. Damn, girl. And now, yeah, we've changed character. Characters in this game are swapped out regularly for story purposes. You can't do it by choice. And with Regina, you can now use your lightsaber to open the special gate. And again, you do the same thing as you did with Dylan. You absolutely leg it like his last call at the bar. And you take down raptors and earn points and try to make your way to save his ass from the locked door. Although Regina only starts off with a handgun, which is sad. And even worse, she doesn't hold it gangster style like she does in the original. It's the biggest downgrade ever. It's a different route to Dylan's, and there's something really tasty waiting for us. A big Allosaurus. It's like a mini T-Rex. I didn't fancy taking it out with just a pistol, so I ran past it as quick as possible. Before we get to Dylan, we find a little place where we get some information on some poisonous plants that we just passed. Apparently, we need a flamethrower to allow us through. And now I am interested. Why did nobody remind me that there's a flamethrower in Dino Crisis 2? I can't wait to get that. Oh wait, I can buy it. That's nice and convenient. But the drama's not over because those emo Super Sentai are after Regina as well. But Regina is too fast and captures one, a girl who doesn't speak to her. I like how she cuffs her to the piping because if there's one thing Regina is acutely aware of, it's that raptors most certainly can open doors. So not only is this girl jail bait, she's also dino bait. To which one may master. We'll see why she's so important later. But uh, yeah, now I've got a flamethrower, I can burn the poisonous plants away. There's something oddly satisfying about taking out these flowers. You don't want to waste fuel, so you just gently pop off a little bit of flame to burn them to a crisp. It feels like you're blowing out a candle on a cake, except the other way around. You're incinerating the cake, not extinguishing it. From here, you'll end up on the same path straight to Dylan, but not before the most annoying enemy in Dino Crisis 1 also makes an appearance here, the Pterodon. These guys boil my piss. I tried to take them down with some sweet submachine guns that I bought, but even with Regina auto-aiming like some malfunctioning robot, I gave up and legged it. 
Which, as you'll have gathered, is not what you want to do in this game, it's the total opposite of Dino Crisis 1. In that game, you want to avoid fighting due to the lack of ammo. But in Dino Crisis 2, you want to avoid running away because you need the points for essential upgrades. Ammo is pretty much infinite here, so running away is kind of a waste. I find my way to his room, but the key he slid under the door isn't usable at this terminal. So the only place we can go from here is the medical facility with the door that I stared at 20 minutes ago. Using her lightsaber, we can get into the room with a bunch of keys, but only one can be taken at a time. Now, if this was Dino Crisis 1, you'd probably have to like juggle like three or four of these keys. You get this key over there, you take it over there, you swap it for this one, you stick this one in the dead researcher's arse to get his ID print, and then, but no. Here you swap this one for the correct one and then that's it. And if you have a good memory like myself, you choose the blue one because the door was blue. It's genius. Dylan and Regina take the girl back to the ship only to find the time drive has been raided. That's why you don't dock in Liverpool folks. Lesson learned. And not only the time drive but also the battery for the boat to move like a normal boat. They should have brought spares. Deciding they need to fix this, Dylan bumps into the girl for the first time and then something weird happens. Hey. What are you doing? Stop it. God, I wish I was that magnetic with the ladies. Well, I am magnetic, just polar magnetic. They don't stroke my face, they laugh at it. It's almost as though she recognizes him. I love the smell of burning Allosaurus in the morning. Now, you're not exactly given a clear direction as to where to go right now, but the only place you can actually go that's new is where Regina just captured the girl. Playing as Regina, you may have noticed the vine-ridden door that only Dylan can open. So that's where we're going. And Regina does vaguely suggest this place, but you'd have to know what this place is actually called. It's here we come across another new enemy. I don't know what they're called, but I'll call them a Pucasaurus because they love drop kicking you and spitting acid at you. They're not too much trouble to deal with, however, since they go down pretty quickly, there's just always a lot of them. This is the part of the game where you annoyingly have to chase a compy. Yeah, compies haven't had much of a footprint on these games so far, but this is their starring role. What is that role? Being a cheeky little shit. Just as you're about to open the door with your shiny silver keycard, this little magpie wannabe decides to nab it. So now you have to chase him down, all the while fighting off Pucasauruses. The key to catching him is opening this little cage in the other room, blocking off a few exits, which I assume were for the base's cat or something, and then you make a trap for him yourself. It's harder than it looks because you have to know which doors you need to open, which ones need to be locked, that sort of thing. Not exactly my favourite part of the game, but I suppose it's different. In the next room, you get a starter battery for your boat, while you can also read a document that talks vaguely about the girl you just found, at least those of her kind, suggesting they too may be from a different time period. Maybe from the future! There's only one place to go now, and that's back to the boat, which means trekking all the way back there again. Yeah, Dino Crisis 2 isn't afraid to let the player do some rather tedious backtracking, but hey, I just used all my sweet points to buy this energy cannon, I might as well put it to use on this Allosaurus. Back on the boat, the girl has disappeared. You and Regina speculate that she may not be from around here. I love how Dylan casually says that he's been thinking about the possibility rather than the fact he just read it in a document. We all know those people who pretend it was on their own genius rather than just reading it on Wikipedia. Prick. Now with the boat operational, just not in the time warping sense, you can travel to one of two other locations. The town is still off limits and there's been no suggestion to go there right now, but if we want to get back to our own time period, it's likely there may be parts for it at the energy facility. Just as we get on our way, we end up in our very first minigame. Something like this to throw at you once in a while, the game turns into a rail shooter as plesiosaurs and pterodons chase your boat down. You are on the machine gun as this goes on for a good two and a half minutes, which I personally find exhausting, like mentally, especially due to the ferocity they come at you. These are genuinely the most tense parts of the game and I kind of like them, but I don't like them because they're just massively stressful. I'm not really a fan of light gun shooters for that reason, but uh, I can appreciate they add something else to the proceedings. You're now at the research facility with Regina, and it's here where points become almost a joke 
because these Divi Plesiosaur keep popping their heads up and they die incredibly easy and give you big points and they're everywhere. I bought a heavy machine gun with 400 bullets, yet one bullet takes them down. It's like candy from a baby. Now, I, I think dinosaurs are finite in this game. You can't grind like a billion points or anything like that. So they do run out eventually. But you know, from here, I felt super safe. I felt like I always had enough points. The pterodons, however, well, they can be flushed down the toilet. Speaking of flushing something down the toilet, this part of the game, because as you get to the door, you have one of the weirdest design choices ever made. Like, someone made this design choice. You find out that actually the door is locked. The dead guard next to the door wrote a note saying he probably left it in the jungle somewhere in some water. All the way back in the place you've just been. So now, after arriving here going through endless plesiosaurs and pterodons, the game wants you to just go all the way back. There is no way of knowing this prior to this event, unless you're me and you remember being incredibly angry at this game for it, you can in fact pick this card up earlier when you're in that area. There's no way to know it, but it's, it is actually there. It's very rare I would tell a game to go fornicate itself, but this, this is a moment. Remember, someone on the dev team said, you know what, let's do this, and then everyone said, Great idea! Like, was this bring your kid to work day during that part of the development? Such utter bizarre design, I'm not even sure a kid would be that sadistic towards the player. Even by accident! What were they thinking? In the facility, we learn that a couple of mechanics never returned from an underwater inspection, and unfortunately, one of them, Bob, is the guy who has the key to the nearby town. If it's not quite clear at this point, I'm not exactly enamoured with the story and the situation humanity's got itself into. Because let me get this straight. There is one guy called Bob who has the key to the entire city. There's only one key, by the way. And this guy called Bob has been sent underwater with the key, with the key, into an underwater facility where there are dinosaurs everywhere. I think humanity deserves this. I guess we could do with the key, right? The survivors, if there are any, will be in the city, we'd hope. After finding the code and ID card to let us go into the underwater section, we have a fun little minigame puzzle thing. In order to turn on the power, you have to play whack-a-mole with these switches. If they turn red, you have to swipe them with your lightsaber. It's a pretty inventive way to involve the sub-weapon. I mean, it's entirely useless outside of opening doors and this, so, you know, it, I appreciate they did something with it. Grabbing the wetsuit, you delve deep into my favourite part of the game. I have to admit, I find water kind of scary. I mean, I can swim, I've been on boats, I will continue to go on boats, but you gotta admit, you can't trust water. I don't trust water as far as I can throw it, and considering I can barely pick the fucker up, I don't trust it much. It's dangerous, scary, and your movement is hindered. Humans are not at their peak in water, even that Australian dude. Add in Jurassic Peril with predators silently slithering around the depths, and man, this balls to the wall action game just went back to horror. And your only weapon is a nail gun against dinosaurs. <laughs> Thankfully, Fairly quickly, you can handily buy an underwater grenade launcher, which is an oddly specific thing. I bet they don't sell too many of those on Amazon. This is a pretty long section of the game, and not only does it change up the gameplay in a horror sense, but it adds a fun little jump mechanic as well, so it becomes a platformer, which is essential for getting around, because you'll be doing some underwater platforming as you take the grenade launcher to blow up this supporting pole in order to reach this dead dude. Eventually, what happens is you find Bob and you steal his key, because that's what we came for. But we can't go to the city just yet because we've got a boss fight. A giant plesiosaur is in the house, swimming around and around and you got to sneakily shoot at it while avoiding him grabbing you. It's pretty cool actually, it feels super tense and kinetic despite being underwater. Almost sadly, it dies just a bit too quickly, otherwise this would have been really epic. Anyways, after a super awkward bit of banter from Dylan and Regina, you get a call from, uh, check my notes, uh, David the Cowboy. 
He's at Edward City with survivors. Where did he get the key from? And we need to go help him. Instead of taking the boat, it seems we're walking there. Along the way, I picked up two badass weapons, an anti-tank rifle, as well as a chain mine, which is actually a sub-weapon you can swap in for your machete. This is actually essential for the game, and you can't complete it without it, which is weird that it doesn't force you to buy it. So, yeah, if you arrive at this rock and you need to blow it up, if you didn't buy it, well, tough luck, you got to go back and buy it. This is a cool-looking area. Totally unrealistic, but I'll let that slide. Flowing lava, pretty cool. What's not cool are these new dinosaurs introduced here. They are armored enemies and they take a beating to kill. The best way is to flip them over with the mines and then shoot their soft belly underneath. But I didn't really want to waste my mines because who knows how many rocks will be in the way. It was actually kind of touch and go. Especially could be annoying if you go back to a previous screen transition where the dinosaurs respawn so you have to kill them again. Great for points, but not really great for this one occasion that ammo seems thinner than the hair on the back of my head. I tell you, I was mightily relieved when I got to the end of this small section. But the roller coaster ride isn't over yet. In fact, it's just starting, guys. This is the part of the game where the all out action gets even more intense and arcadey if it wasn't already. Because, firstly, you have this rather interesting tag team session where there are just a few too many Allosauruses to face. So one of you stays up in a cannon while the other legs it with a flare gun. Using the flare gun will signify where one of the cannons should fire to. You can use this to kill the Allosaurus and blow up the containers blocking the way. It's a fun little gimmick that lasts about two minutes. Feels like it could have gone on longer or at least reuse it elsewhere in the game. But no, they showed restraint. Make it not outstates welcome. Commendable. And then... Another mini game, this time return to something similar. Instead of being chased by plesiosaurs on a boat, this time it's by angry Triceratops mamas. Her baby is dead and she ain't asking questions. In fact, she probably can't even form questions in her head because she's a dinosaur. This one is slightly more awkward since you can only go side to side for some reason. There's no up or down, which I get could make it extra unwieldy, but uh, it means you have to wait until the Triceratops is in the perfect position. You have to be more reactive than proactive, and you have to react quick because they don't mess around. And it's not just one, I guess their sister joins in too on the rampage. They're always ready for a scrap, but they come from a council estate. Thankfully this is about half as long as the plesiosaur one, which means it's half as stressful. The end of that section, however, signifies another long-awaited CGI cutscene. We're finally in Edward City where the survivors we just saw are now apparently dead. I guess David coming to help you meant the defences in the city were low and the dinos took over. Good job David. I just feel like there was a chunk of game missing here since we're standing next to a burned out chopper. Like, is that David's? Did he crash? I don't know. It feels rushed at this point. It's like, quick, the PS2's coming out soon. We've got to get this out now. With everyone dead, the only thing to do now is grab the research data and fix your time gate thingy. In a local shop, there is a random note about how the military were wanting to use third energy missiles to destroy the dinosaurs. Again, it doesn't make sense. But the research data has been taken to the missile silo. Why is there a missile silo in a research base? And not only that, Oh no, there's also a tank section here which comes in handy against blind T-Rex that's still hanging around. Oh yeah, another mini game of sorts. You're now controlling a tank in a game with tank control. It's beautiful and it plays pretty fun. Maybe a bit confusing at first since you just panic, you don't really know what to do. You can blast the T-Rex to put him off, but you also need to keep an eye out for the obstacles in your way in your escape path. So you need to keep rotating your turret and also making sure you're heading in the right direction. I've got to applaud this T-Rex, he takes a damn beating, taking like 30 tank shells to the face and still chasing you, but then he gets stuck in the city, sucker.
We then meet some more dark spandex ninjas, one of whom is interrupted by the girl we apprehended an hour or two ago. Before buggering off again, she drops something Dylan recognises. His dead sister's necklace. Which you know what that signifies, is a classic case of... Oh god, we're coming to the end of the game, we need some sort of character development. Turns out our clean cut military man wasn't always so perfect. He was in a gang, and his mother and sister were killed in a house invasion. Probably his fault. Conveniently, you find a gas mask right there, which means you can finally cross a path you couldn't previously. Even with the flamethrower, you couldn't get past this poisonous section without the gas mask, so it's back to the first area of the game. Yeah, that, that's the city, done with. It was like four screens or something. What a waste. Running through to the missile silo section, you pick up the data disk left in the computer, and now it's time to try to head home. I swear I saw this exact scene in Jurassic Park 3. I mean, Dino Crisis 2 came out earlier, so I'm pretty sure the writer of Jurassic Park 3 played this game. The Gigantosaurus is now the big boss dino. Somehow, Dylan sneaked past it, following you inside the building. Things get worse for our hero since something's malfunctioning and the missile is gonna launch. How did this get past safety inspection? Who did the quality control on this? I wonder if there's one of those little stickers to show who checked this over. This is a decidedly easy boss fight as the Gigantosaurus protects the missile. I guess it took me a few chomps to realize what I was supposed to do, but once you realize you just have to press a green button which squirts gas out, and then you hit it with your lightsaber, it'll produce a nice mini flamethrower. You just go back and forth between terminals and burn the dino to a crisp. As you can see, there is a timer which did panic me slightly, because after that, there's another one of those puzzles. Your lightsaber getting a workout here. Anyways, thankfully, Regina is a rocket engineer, so she can easily disable the missile when she gets to the panel, crisis averted, but not before the Gigantosaurus goes all nuclear on us by destroying the whole thing. Talk about being melodramatic, but at least you survived, somehow, and Another minigame thing, David needs to open the water gate. I had no idea who was a journalist, and since you're working for the government, I'd have thought you'd need to take him out. But no, you're not CIA, so you need to protect him. This would be more fun with a light gun, I've got to be honest. After David's heroics, he gets even more heroic. See ya, David. We hardly knew ya. Nice randomly finding that rocket launcher, though. Is that his, like, special move? Picking a rocket launcher out of his arse from nowhere? It's powerful, but has a long cooldown timer. Dylan washes up ashore and sees that mysterious girl again who invites him to her home. Wow, she's keen. Don't fall for it, Dylan. Easy nooky. A lifetime of psychological torture. Once you're in, they don't let you out. Oh look, another gameplay mechanic. God damn Dino Crisis 2, pulling out all the variety. But uh, this time it's an escort mission, and thankfully my flamethrower doesn't hurt her, so these baby raptors can burn baby burn. We eventually make it inside some sort of futuristic facility. And if you thought that up to this point the plot was kind of nonsensical, well this is the point where it all comes together into one big globbage of guffage nonsense. I switched off quickly at this point, but here are the bullet points that I gathered from this. The children came from the future. They were kept alive and fed knowledge, 
but the pod was designed for dinosaurs. So the knowledge they got was what dinosaurs would get. So they can't speak very well and they kind of act like dinosaurs. And also this facility was run by this guy who is actually Dylan, our hero. This is our hero in the future, leaving a recorded message for himself. And this, this is his daughter. <sighs> When, what other load of shit did we get told? Oh yeah, how could I forget this nugget of nonsense? Something like, they did an experiment, they ballsed it up, and something happened to the Cretaceous period. Basically, the dinosaur timeline went wrong, which massively affected future for humans, and they wouldn't even exist. So, here's the genius part. They transported dinosaurs into the far future, to protect them from the event and then wanted to send them back to make sure the timeline was all right. Look, I don't know. I, I don't get it. I mean, I get it. It's just either I'm dumb or this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in terms of a plot twist. I think I'd have preferred it if Dylan turned out to be a ghost all along. That was popular. Why not do that? But no, they had to do a double time warping dinosaur Noah's Ark. And this old bastard spends literally four minutes talking about it, as though we're supposed to understand their logic. Anyways, there is one last encounter with a now toasty Gigantosaurus, and there's a countdown until the time gate that's here gets blowed up or something. I've just given up on the story. Let's just press a few buttons and annihilate this dinosaur from space. Where did this satellite come from? How did this satellite come from? Why did this satellite come from? The facility is blowing up because of course it is, you just nuked it from space. The young girl gets trapped and Dylan doesn't want to leave his daughter behind. So after a quick salute, Regina goes home alone. I heard Macaulay Culkin is on the other side, they organized a date before she left. And that's it, done. There's only one ending to this game, and you get an end screen with Dylan, driving a car. I, I thought he was dead. Well, I got an A rank, which is cool. I don't know why, but I'll take it. As you can see, it's a short game, even shorter than the original. But you do unlock Colosseum, which is a survival arena mode, as you play as various characters, and even a tank, and survive as long as you can. A decent distraction, but nothing I'm going to talk about too much. So what do I think of it? Well, as I've hammered home more times than I've tried putting up a shelf, Dino Crisis 1 and 2 are completely different animals. And that is great. Chalk and cheese, both are great. One's great on a sandwich, the other's great on Italian food. There's something a bit different, but they excel in what they try to achieve. They don't try to be like each other, they try to stand out in different genres. And while I think Dino Crisis 1 is a great survival horror, I think Dino Crisis 2 is an excellent run-and-gun action game. It provides four hours worth of thrills, non-stop balls-to-the-wall action where there's more ammo than I've had breakfast. At the time of writing this, I have been alive 11,971 days, so that's at least 11,971 breakfasts, give or take. I may have skipped a few, obviously not recently, but you know, I'm pretty sure there's more ammo in this game than breakfast I've eaten. For an action game with fixed camera angles and tank controls, the action flows superbly well. It takes a little bit of getting used to with the auto aim because you have to initiate it yourself, and it can target the enemy you don't really want to. But blasting dinosaurs like their balloons is fantastic. There's almost no horror, and the tense danger isn't really there in the main parts of the game, just because you're so overpowered. But there's something really gratifying about that. It's fun, addictive, and perhaps one of the best of its kind on the system. Because the production value is there. You can see they put so much effort into creating a triple A title for the time. Visually, it holds up really well. It doesn't look as good as the Dreamcast version of the first game, but you know, it's a PS1 game and it's got great visuals for that. The character models are super detailed, not grainy at all, and the animation is genuinely excellent for the era. Well, aside from the over-exaggerated dodge rolls, which makes it really look like it could be an episode of Super Sentai. Just the way the characters move, walk, jog, run, I was really impressed, and the background's superb. 
I'm speculating that they dumped the 3D backgrounds and went back to the safety of pre-render due to the amount of dinos they wanted on screen at once. It's much cheaper on the processing power to have a JPEG background, but I think it works well in the game's favor. Even though I thought they did a great job in Dino Crisis 1, I can't imagine it working so well in 3D in Dino Crisis 2 with so many jungle environments. It's too natural, which means it's more difficult to make in 3D, at least make it look good compared to indoor man-made structures. And of course, even though it's blurry and stretched by today's standards, this would have looked far more realistic back in the day on a CRT. And I think it still looks good, even if all the real-time 3D models stick out more than me at a party. The lonely dude in the corner just drinking by himself, wishing he could go home and play Romance of the Three Kingdoms while the other people play a different kind of romance game. Losers, with your one-night stands! The voice acting is pretty decent for the time, and the music from the bits I listened to, outside all the machine guns chugging away, seemed like a step up. At least it wasn't like overly offensive to the ears like the first game. I like the fact there are so many weapons in this game, it's a relief compared to the stingy original. And each character has their own weapon set, which is great. The only issue with the weapons is that you don't really get much time with each of them. The game's short, and you unlock some of them really quickly, and there's barely much point in upgrading most of them. Just upgrade the one that you're using until you get the best weapon in the game at the end, and then spend all your cash on that. And that's really the fault of the game's length. Granted, it's a relentless action game that could outstay its welcome if padded out, but I do think it's still too short. Four hours, and probably an hour or so of that is backtracking through places you've already been. It just needed to be bigger, longer. Not necessarily in the story or anything, just in the in-between bits. The walking between the research facility and the city, that could have been much longer. The city itself, that section is minuscule, you spent like 10 minutes there. It could have been epic going into shops, blasting dinos in the park. There is a lot of potential there that I felt was unexplored. And due to the abruptness of some scenes and story development, it does feel like originally it was planned to have longer sections because you can see the survivors fighting and then when you get there, they're all dead and David's chopper is knackered. What happened there? More was definitely supposed to happen here and I don't care what you say. One of the biggest compliments I can give Dino Crisis 2 is the shake-up in gameplay. Pretty much all of the time it's trying to add in something new, something different to the normality of running and blasting. Those light gun sequences with the plesiosaurs, triceratops protecting David, the escort mission, tag team flare thing, the tank, and the best part of the whole game, going underwater. It doesn't let you rest on your laurels because you'd obviously squash them. Laurels must be one of the most endangered plant species of all time with how many people are sitting their fat asses on them, but not with Dino Crisis 2. While I don't think they're all integrated perfectly, nor are most of them as fun as the standard gameplay, I think they really help aid the game. They stop the main gameplay from becoming boring, or at least exhausting. Just these little two minute distractions are enough to shake things up. It's like you just downed an espresso. While you may not completely enjoy it, you feel revitalized and ready to go again. If I did have some other criticisms, well, I'm pretty sure you can guess one of them, Dino Crisis 1 and 2 do have some things in common. They have dinosaurs, they have Regina, and a penchant for the plot shitting the bed in the second half. Although Dino Crisis 1 is more like a cat who shits on your pillow, it's like a little gift kind of thing, like, you know, them weird cats. Dino Crisis 2, that's just full on nuclear dysentery. I just don't get it. I mean, I get the plot, it's just kind of rubbish. Even from right at the beginning of Dino Crisis 2, it starts off bad. It's like they didn't care to make something vaguely within the realms of believability. And I know, it's dinosaurs, you can't make it believable, but there is a certain line that can be stood behind to make it more intriguing. Jurassic Park does it well. Yeah, it's dumb, but there's a willingness on the consumer to suspend their disbelief. They're willing to do it because there is some essence of reality to latch onto. Wibbly wobbly time vortexes and dinosaurs Noah's Ark, you've, you've lost me. Disbelief cannot be suspended, it's been untethered and dropped down the Grand Canyon. It doesn't ruin the game for me I suppose because the gameplay is still great and fun, but it definitely makes me less interested in what the next game is going to be about because it's also probably going to be dumb. Oh, it's dinosaurs in space, of course. I know some people hate stories in video games, but I love them, and so I always look for a well-told story interwoven with interesting gameplay, even if it's about dinosaurs 
I just kind of want a decent story, alright? Another minor complaint, perhaps the sub-weapons. Such wasted potential. What's the point in the machete aside from opening three mandatory doors? What's the point in the lightsaber aside from the same thing? Well, at least with that they stretch it to two mini puzzles, but I don't know why they've been built up as a major feature in the game. I'm not saying Dylan should have gone all crocodile Dundee on us with the raptors, but maybe there could have been more use for them. Like if a raptor pinned you down, you could have a quick time event to pull your knife on them to avoid damage, or maybe there could have been a tense moment in the game where you lose your gun and you have to fight one on one with a raptor with only your knife. I don't know, maybe I played too much Resident Evil 4 as a kid. Overall though, the positives outweigh the criticisms. I don't tend to be an all action guy when it comes to video games, or in real life, so I'm not exactly magnetised towards this sort of experience, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is an excellent time. In fact, in terms of gameplay, it's one of the best in show on the system. I can understand why fans of the original Dino Crisis would be distraught at the whiplash in genre switch, because while it's not perfect, Dino Crisis 1 had potential to morph into a perfect survival horror series like Resident Evil did from 1 to 2, but I think two decades later, some of the less bitter, more adult gamers should be able to get over it and appreciate Dino Crisis 2 for what it is. In fact, Dino Crisis 2, despite being like a totally different game, is probably the better of the two if you take them as they are. They each have their own flaws, but as PS1 games, I would say both of these should be in your collection no matter which genre you're into, as both games can be regarded as critical and commercial successes. This nascent series had a bright future, but unfortunately for Dino Crisis, Dino Crisis 3 happened and that beacon of hope turned into a black hole of disappointment. I'm not going into Dino Crisis 3 for a variety of reasons, I don't think it's the time or place. This is a celebration of the series, not a reading of the charges as to why it's been put on death row. Maybe I'll cover Dino Crisis 3 as its own horror show video in the future, digging into how it could have possibly gone so wrong, but wrong it went. In 2003, Dino Crisis 3 disappointed gamers everywhere, including myself. As a fan of Dino Crisis 1 and 2, 3 was just unbelievably bad, and that's despite some of the most impressive production value around. But yeah, that killed the series, and we haven't seen anything since. But, my dear subscribers, if you want to see me talk about some of the spin-offs of Dino Crisis, check out my Patreon right now. There's a video on there as I talk about Dino Stalker and a mobile spin-off, so that is a double whammy about my thoughts on those. You can see a short preview very shortly. Remember, on my Patreon, you can get ad-free videos on there, you get to vote, you get access to updates on Discord, and behind-the-scenes videos. They get videos early, basically, I'm desperate for their approval and want to give them their money's worth. A big thank you to my super producers, they, Sven Nowlerts, Wixit, Jcross7776, FF14 Best RPG, Alexander Kato. Thank you for your support, it really means so much to me, alongside my other Patreon supporters. Thank you. So, what's next? Next up is a game some of you have been waiting a year for, As Your Dreams. Yes, I'm finally getting to it. When I started this channel over a year ago, I listed it as one of my priorities. It's going to be an interesting one since I'm going to have to structure it very differently than usual since it's a non-linear game. I'm going to have to test my rubbish writing skills a little bit more. So yeah, look forward to that in the coming weeks or earlier on my Patreon, patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan.